We are really lucky to have him here. He's been here working on the base for 50 years. He just recently retired about a year ago. Mm -hmm. So 50 years he's been here. And this is just a quick summary of what he's done. I'm just going to read it because I couldn't edit it because all of it is very important and I just I couldn't leave any of it out. So in the 1950s, the first task was he was increasing the sensitivity range of the polar graphic apparatus at the analysis of seawater. He developed and pat patented a differential thermal analysis apparatus for thermal analysis of propellants. He developed a single probe DTA apparatus for propellant studies. He went on a tour of the Army and then back to graduate school. In the 60s, he conducted thermal studies on many explosives and propellants. He developed standard thermal tests using kinetic parameter data on explosives and propellants with heat flow equations to determine self-heating and critical temperature for a given mass in geometry of material. He developed a small-scale cook-off bomb test, apparatus and procedures for determining the severity of a cook-off reaction and relating these results back to actual warheads, bombs, and rocket motors. In the 70s, he developed and patented an outgassing, inhibiting liner system for bombs and warheads to reduce the severity of a cook-off reaction during a carrier deck fire. The Harpoon Warhead used this liner system and it's in the fleet use. An input to the NAVBORD OD44811 safety manual in regards to thermal requirements in qualifying new explosives. He was involved in three court cases involving explosions occurring on trains carrying munitions, which is what you'll talk, hear about today. The fallout of the court cases was the Safe Tran Transport of Munitions program. This was the development of a self-contained reusable firefighting unit that could be placed inside a rail car carrying munitions that could control an internal, internal fire for over an hour. In the 80s, he worked on a train fire involving a portion of a missile system lost to the fire. The railroad offered 2.5K, government collected 1.4 million. Out of three other cases, the suits against the U.S. was in excess of 150 million and out-of-court settlement was 9.25 million. So he got it down a little bit there. <laughs> Worked on the explosive advanced development and IMTTP programs, which helped to promote PBXC and PBXC, well, PBXC 116 and 129, explosives for warheads used because of their mild cook-off reactions, developed a super small scale cook-off bomb which uses a smaller sample than the SCB and introduced variable confinement features. The SCB test was accepted by the UN and the DOT as the standard USA thermal test. Developed containers for the Harpoon warhead and the Gator submunition dispenser to inhibit sympathetic de detonation in a given container and between containers. In the 1990s, he developed a container for the SLAM ER warhead, warhead that would inhibit SD action in the vertical, horizontal, and di <coughs> diagonal directions. The container design was based on the use of PBXC-129 explosive, a titanium warhead, and a combination of pumice and aluminum plate to reduce the probability of sympathetic detonation. detonation. This container design won the Herbert M. Lapidus Trophy at the National Institute of Packaging, Handling, and Logistics Engineering, um, 1998 Military Industrial Technology Symposium in Providence, Rhode Island. The Lapidus Trophy was awarded for the container being named the best of show. After it, it also won the lifelong package design category. Besides the NIPHLE honors, the container also received a judge's award of merit from the Institute of Packaging Professionals in the 1997 Ameristar Packaging Competition held in Anaheim and a World Star Award from the World Packaging Organization in 1997 competition, which was judged in Prague, the Czech Republic, and awarded in Mexico City. And he's current, well, no, I don't know if he's currently, but he's probably done with this, developing a technique to measure the critical mass of a given gun propellant as part of the predictive technology program. So you guys can see he's been really, really productive and busy over all these years. And before we get started, I wanted to award him our library certificate of appreciation because you guys kind of get up and go afterwards and you don't get to see how nice it is. So this is presented to Jack Pakalak. Thank you for sharing your story of the Roseville bomb train mystery.
Thank you, Jack. Thank you. See, after that, I better go home. <laughs> no, the, the train, the Roosevelt study, I would call it, rather than the, just a court case or something like that. Um, very simply, it was a train that started off in Hawthorne with uh, 21 cars of Mark 81 bombs filled with tritonol. Those bombs were then transferred to, to another train, to another train, <coughs> finally to a train, an ammunition train for Southern Pacific that went over the loop, came down the hill, down into here, Antelope, into Antelope Valley, Antelope Yard uh, for its final resting pit place. Normally we think of this as a, an unmundane event. But as we studied the train as it, after the explosion, during the explosion, we had some 10 years of, in court. This should have lasted a few months, but <laughs> you know how lawyers are, they gotta earn a living. Anyway, <clears throat> the train came up here, but start back here at Sparks. The train crew came on board the, uh, there to go board the train to take off on it. The train, the crew was late. They were ready to pull on a new crew and set the train on its way. And there was a mail train behind this train. Well, they said let the mail train go first because the mail train is light. This train has heavy cargo on it. It's got 100 cars plus 10 sleepers and 21 cars of ammunition. So <clears throat> he, at this point here, the crew finally shows up. There's a bitter argument about that train going ahead of the mail train. He does get his way and goes ahead of the mail train. Why? I don't know. And we could never figure it out, even in the court battle. And as we came over Dominant Pass here, the average speed was about 27 miles an hour. For 110 cars, that's going very, very fast. He kept ahead of the mail train. Now, he came down the hill here, and about mile post 154, something like that, the train stopped. The mail train catches up with it. Here's a caboose, nobody there. He radios back the Norton Summit here. They said, what the hell's wrong? Do we, can we get some messages out of this train? Here's a railroad crew, you got an ammunition car, you got all kinds of other products on the train too. So the, the uh, mail train had a backup to Norton, go on the eastbound lane track and go around the train. They, they could see nothing. <clears throat> no people, no activity, anything. So the train goes on down the hill. Well, the crew reported later that they had some trouble between two ammunition cars. And we wanted to know, what in the world are you having trouble with an ammunition car? What was the problem? Well, as we get down into the area here, this train takes off again after an hour and a half stop, catches up, well, of course, some time lost with mail train coming, he catches up with the mail train. We didn't know how fast he was going. Well, one of those things is there was somebody out on the yard recording the, uh, the n sound of the train coming down the track. It was a young kid, and well, a young kid, anybody under 50, <laughs> was uh, recording. He had his, uh, dual his dual amplifier so that the noise was not, uh, um, they call logarithmically dec decreased it. So it just stayed louder, louder, and louder. <clears throat> and what he was doing is recording it because he had a model train he wanted to have this to, uh, pa uh, uh, sound with. Uh, a few years later, when we got hold of, we had hold of the train, we tried no, a soundtrack, we didn't know what to do with it. Here at China Lake, they had the Doppler effect. Doppler effect, I think that's right. Anyway, they were able to measure the speed of the train by the increasing of the sound coming to it. <clears throat> At the time this recording was taken, he was going not quite 35 miles an hour. He should have been doing 22. And he caught up with the mail train. How we know this? The train tracks had warnings on it. He got two yellow warnings. The next warning was red. 
stop. You bring that train to a halt. That somewhere is in here someplace. He brings it to a halt. So <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> he comes down. The rest is pretty immature. He goes through a hot box detector. And of course, we're interested in the hot box detector because a hot box detector has two ways of looking at it. The floor is um, a heat source, but it's a reference point for a, a gas type uh, IR detector. It looks at the floor, and that's the standard. Then it looks at the journal box and to see if it's hotter than the floor. It should be a little hotter. If you've got roller bearings in the uh, gear train there for the wheels, it is quite a bit hotter. DOD uh, cars at that time had what they call uh, brass or a bushing, brass bushing and oil and rags. It was much cooler. <clears throat> so what we were looking for, did we have a hot box in that train coming down? 21 cars. They were cooler, they were the coolest uh, boxes, uh, hot boxes on the whole, of all the train. There was back in this train here as it was pulled into the Antelope Yard, about halfway back 50 cars, there was one car where <clears throat> I, I had a chance of reading the, the hot, hot box recording and I thought I saw this one thing. I said, why is my reference point different than my box? The guy looked over and he said, oh, the floor is on fire. The floor was hotter than the journal box. So this car is back here. Now, we have people on the way. You can see there's on the other map there is people pointed out seeing smoke coming out of the car. One was a railroad man. He saw the train coming around. About halfway up the train, he sees smoke, and uh, he didn't see fire, but black smoke pouring out of the train. Our ammunition cars are located very close to the front end. Only a few cars from the front end, about five, 15 cars from the front end. The train, as I said, it was 100 cars long, but in the middle of the car, there are three pusher units. So they were behind the pusher units, and apparently the fire did not catch the eye of the engineer in the pusher car, uh, pusher uh, locomotives. Best we can tell, he was asleep, and it, he paid for it. Got got drunk. Was this at night? It was Saturday, Sunday, April 27, 28. Daylight saving time changed. <laughs> Right here. <laughs> so it was after, it was like one to two in the morning. Yeah, yeah it, well, two never, see, which hour never occurs? Two? It becomes three? So that was a kind of a mix up on the time sometime. People have seen it because a railroad stays on railroad time. You can't change time on a railroad going across, it has to stay on time. So you do have <coughs> corrections here. Daylight time, standard time, given on the track there. So we would keep notice of that. Um, <clears throat> the, um, coming back to this point where the train was stopped, um, we went back up to the area where it was stopped at with the uh, lawyers. Um, probably should have asked permission with her. Uh, railroad company because they don't like you going on their property. Um, they carry high-powered rifles. I've been fired at once. They missed it completely, made sure they hit a branch, but they're pretty high. I got the message. I left. But um, <clears throat> we went back up to this point where the train stopped. Uh, every, anytime a train at some point and it stops, it is well marked on recordings and stuff like that. There's, a, there's all kinds of things in the whole, probably within inches where the front end of that engine was. So we went back and we walked up the train and said, well, what in the world? Was there a fire here someplace? Was there, we had some burnt wood? We went back about 50 cars or so and we looked in the side of the hill and there was a ca cavern going into the, ca uh, like a, an old uh, tunnel or something like that. And there was tire tracks there. So we looked at what is in this car. He pulls out a sheet, TVs, and hi-fi. We didn't know at that time, but as we went into the court case on this thing, Southern Pacific was allowing 
the people are testifying against the government or whatever they want they thought they could do for they thought they were doing something famous. In the meantime, Southern Pacific was working with the FBI with uh, uh, dark light or something and catching all these people stealing. So after they testified on the witness bin, they were arrested and put in jail. You know, they, they So this is what made this thing interesting for many years. <laughs> um, as we came in, into the uh, Roseville Yard, the Roseville Yard is about six miles long, and it ties into the Antelope Yard, which is about a mile long. And what we have here is the front end of the mile uh, long Antelope Yard. And you can see some of the pictures here, and just give you an idea. The train moved in at 7.05, parked at 7.05, and up in this region in here, we got a can factory that took aluminum and steel cans and melted them down and separated out the metals. So they saw smoke that morning. Some said they saw it at, at uh, 7.15, 7.30. But um, the SP workers always had to report back to the boss to make sure they had the right number. And they never came back with the same answer. Anyway. <coughs> The smoke came out. Some said it was black, some said it was white. Well, probably if you saw the news recently, black and white smoke are hard to tell apart, <laughs> even when they, they try to go for a pope. So what I did is burn a fire. It was diesel fuel. So we lit the fuel and let the smoke come up. And I had people at different points around the fire and the sun at one angle. Those that had a certain angle saw almost white smoke. Those that had the other angle, almost black smoke. So depending on your angle, you could have saw anything. But you can see from here, this here is the ammunition car that hasn't blown up yet. It's got a door land on the side, and that's about the third car in. So there's this car, and there's a line here, so there's a second, maybe third car right there that hasn't, went, hasn't detonated it. So this is about 9 o'clock in the morning. The, um, this is at the range, that car will be here. Now, there was, let's the, see, make sure I stay on clue here. I got a question. I'm sure. a little confused. The ammunition cars were at the head of the train. You said the first 15 cars? No, 15 cars separated the head of the train from the first ammunition car. 15 okay, or now, 17. Okay, now where was the pusher engine behind the ammunition? Way behind. Way behind. Where was the car or which car was on fire? One of the ammunition? No. Cars or some other car? When I looked at the all the uh, infrared data I had, the fire appeared to be coming about 50 to 60 cars in. Our cars started at uh, car about 16, then there was 21 cars, and then uh, regular cars after that. behind the pusher engine, or was it ahead of the pusher engine? Should have been behind the pusher engine, Behind yeah. the pusher, okay, got the picture. And now what that's based on is a railroad man was uh, coming home from work or something like that, and he saw the train coming down the hill, and he said, wow, that's a lot of black smoke, and he could see the caboose. Now, what bothered me was there were supposed to have been 10 more cars on the other side of the caboose. I don't know if he didn't see him because of the roadside, but he did see the caboose, and he did see the smoke coming out of the car. Now, in this explosion where we had rocked the Richter scale two, let's see, the first explosion, 1 1.5, 1 1.6, 2.0, 1.5, 1.5. There's five ex major explosions from the bombs. Now, <clears throat> go, go back to the original part. We, what I wanted to do is explain, here's the train, it got into the yard, it caught on fire somehow. Now, how did it catch on fire? Was it sabotage? Was it whatever? Well, first of all, when the ATF, uh, FBI, and the Navy JAG called in, I guess the experts from, I assume, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, lab in uh, in the D.C. area there. White Oak, that's what I was trying to think of, White Oak. White Oak uh, came out with their experts, <laughs> took one look at it, said what kind of bombs, they were Mark 81s, 250 pound bombs, right now filled. They said it couldn't happen. And basically, they didn't want to get their hands on it because it wasn't pure, pure research, it was a dirty court case and you don't like to get into those if you don't want to. Uh, uh, myself, Howard Schaefer, Bill McEwen and Taylor Joyner, we were four that were selected. Uh, Taylor, because he was a kinetic, he did quite a bit of kinetic work on explosives. I did a lot of cook-off work on it. Howard Schaefer did worldwide uh, uh, studies on storage of ex materials, explosives. And McEwen, because from World War II, he observed some of the bomb actions in rail yards in Italy. <coughs> uh, now, the engine, when we were in the courtroom, things happened that delayed the court case. The engineer that <coughs> brought the train in uh, had the four, four leads, brought it in, parked it, came into the station about the time of the first explosion, uh, in the rest, uh, dressing room, about the time of the first explosion, which was about 8.03. He disappeared. It took the FBI three weeks to find him in Chicago because he said he, was, he had leave time coming, so he left. Well, no one knew. <laughs> <laughs> so after we, we had to bypass him, we could get the engineer uh, that had, it was in the uh, uh, pusher cars. And he's the one that said when they parked the, the car here, about this area right here, they parked it right against a leaker that was, had caught fire or something else. I don't know what the story was on it. Anyway, he kept bragging about it because after he got off the train, he hit for the local watering hole, he and a bunch of other people, and they, he was complaining about him them parking that damn train there. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, understand how he knew it was being parked there because he was already separated in the uh, 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 Rosewell track, tra uh, it's uh, six mile. They had a pay and they were just pulling the train with a helper going in through the park the train, the hundred and some cars. The <coughs> they put him on the stand, and guess what happened? Remember, I said he got drunk? That guy got drunk. They tell him to get sober. So he, they brought him out tw again and again. The next time they put a U.S. Marshal with him, keep him sober. <laughs> when he got on the stand now, he had a total lapse in memory. So, couldn't help us any bit there. So, what was going on? Well, some of the things I'd like to bring up before we go into, any, into this. What happened? Because we had a, a thing to say, was it sabotage? Was it, uh, let's see, bad explosive? Uh, the two hours stop up on the hill, did they do something to our train? They said the cars came apart at, at that point. Um, also, we knew about, at this time when we were in court, we were told by the FBI that in a 24-hour period in the United States, we had three ammo train cars derailed. Three train wrecks with ammunition on them. And they were worried about sabotage. What was the Navy worried about? They were worried about explosive. Uh, <clears throat> that was one of the things I got picked for. It wasn't a privilege necessarily, but was tritinol bad? If tritinol is bad, they didn't say, we don't care about the court case. It's 150 million, 200 million, we don't care. If it's bad, we got to download Europe of all tritinol. So my job was to find out, is tritinol bad? And we I pounded that in down the track, the start track, ran bombs into bombs, you know, popped them up in the air, down, bang, took, uh, took them to Tuelli, took a saw and run through a dry saw, bomb after bomb after bomb, just run the saw through it. Sparks flying all over, never a reaction. Then taking a bomb, dropping on another bomb 50 times till they split apart and 
no ignition. The only time I had an ignition is when I th went down the track and <coughs> when the bomb hit the other bomb flat, the bomb that was stationary uh, ignited and burned. That's the only reaction. So a month later, I called back and said I couldn't find anything wrong with Pragnol. Now, what else was going on in the courtroom? A lot of times you think, well, so we got to pay $150 million. Well, I didn't like paying any money. I, I like winning. But uh, <clears throat> there was other things to win. One of the things that they were going for, they wanted to see if they could nail us with the Ultra Hazard Act. This means any time there was a fire or an accident in the yard, you were responsible because you weren't supposed to be there. That's the bottom line of the Ultra Hazard Act. And boy, they were working hard for that. If they had it passed, what they were going to have to do is download our ammunition trains before they came into here, into um, Roseville Yard, back a few miles, download the train, the bombs off of it, onto trucks, go around Antelope and reload the train at some other parking place so that none of the bomb trains ever go through Antelope and uh, Roseville. To give you an idea, even a month later, after they got the yard back together, there was a train load of bombs going to Vietnam where there were Mark 82s. They had a fire on the train. What SP learned at that time is keep the damn noise down. Don't tell people so they can get in the paper. What they hadn't counted on is that the Dan reporters had their little, well, they didn't look like that. They were big units at that date. <clears throat> they had their walkies talkies tuned into their radios. And when they read about the fire, they were out there lying around the room where the car was burning. Fortunately, nothing happened there. But <clears throat> again, when a car burns in a yard, and that's a blows the yard up, it really never makes the newspaper. A fire occurred in a boxcar, a uh, U.S. Navy boxcar in 1963 with Mark 81 bombs in it. The guy saw the smoke coming out of the car. It was, I don't know, the Antelope Yard or Roseville Yard. He went in, he opened up the door, goes into the place, got a fire extinguisher, looked around. Ah, there it is. There's a hole in the floor underneath the bombs and it's burning. Shh, puts it out. It was a one inch report in a fireman's report magazine. None of the local papers or anything like that made it. Well, <clears throat> you can see when we got into the fire, the action going on to there. Here's a character, I never, we never did find his name. We tried to find him, we couldn't find him. Uh, down the road, where it tends to just bleak right here, he had his little uh, uh, VW got stopped there. And a guy got scared, I think. He ran off, never told anybody he left his car there. And before we could identify it, it, there was nothing but a frame left. It got blown to bits. There were no deaths occurred into this accident. One child crossed in here where the house had burned. When the first explosion happened, a little girl put her head up and a piece of glass went in her eye. And she lost eye. As far as I know, that's about the only casualty. There were some burns and stuff like that. But we worked about the sabotage <coughs> of a delayed fire. There was a fire in the yard on the track next to where we pulled in, or on the track. And that's track A7. We had our cars on there, and track A3 was where the leftover three cars that survived the fire. The night before in midnight, there is a station here, a little fire station. They noticed a fire in the yard at midnight. That was, that's the 26th, 27th, I guess. Hadn't, hadn't gone into midnight yet. Uh, I mean, hadn't gone to 2 o'clock. So they noticed a fire. So they called in. It was a three alarm fire. Well, they came in. They saw a line of, track, a line of cars on track A7. And this one car was burning like mad, burning out through the top. It was a sulfur car on fire, burning and boiling sulfur. It was popping down on the ground and stuff like that. They came up to fight the fire. Southern Pacific came up and said, no, no further. Don't come here anymore. Well, I was worried about the next day that parking our car on that same track with any burning and incinerators down in the, in the waste there. 
on top of that, when I went into the track again, I noticed that any time I put my hand down into the track, I went into about that much oil or fuel oil. It's covered between the rails. It just, it just drips in there all the time. And if you got, <coughs> if you think fuel oil is easy to ignite or hard to ignite, what I did is I took a little bit of pan of uh, diesel fuel and put it, I hit it with a torch. It took me a minute to get it to go. Put a rock in there so it breaks the surface. Just go with the torch. It's lit. It's that fast if you got the surface broke. So I went back into there and I wanted to find out what happened at this, this fire the night before. And they said, we didn't have one. I went to the fire department. Other, other than getting a rather a, a nasty treatment. And, and the Depart uh, Department of Justice says, well, what are we going to do about it? It's their place. They, they said there was no fire. And they said, can I, say, can I see the records? Uh, I got them the next day. Bye, gosh, they were right. No fire. No fire at all. Uh, it, it was a wake-up call for me to, to see something like this. Um, as we fought into the case, the case was broken into several parts of uh, liability. And anytime you have a large case, it started off, and, and that day was fairly good size, $150 million. So for the first $100 million, we set out of the court uh, to all, everybody around. Uh, Southern Pacific, United States government, and third parties. Third parties was the boxcars and rails and stuff like this that might be involved into the fire there. So <coughs> um, Southern Pacific, I think, paid 5.6 million. We paid 5.4, and third party 3.6. Settled out of court on that first about $110 million. The next part was Southern Pacific versus the United States. For um, 45, they tried to boost it up. Judge says, no, your original was what you sued. You can't boost it up because it's a few years later. So that's when we had to go and prove everything like I've been talking about, what, what have you. Did we have the fire? Was there an oil fire next to it? Um, anytime we go to court and it was a $40 million suit, when we get down to $24 million, that's 60%. U.S. attorney says, that's the time we settle. I said, no, I'd like to get a little more into it. I said, settle for $24 million. It went down, down, down. And we had another party to work with I didn't realize. I thought, well, I was working with Navy stuff and Air Force stuff. No, the Army has control. They came in and said, what is this? You got them down to $9 million? You sure they'll accept it? Well, <laughs> I said, I'd like to sue them. <laughs> But the, the point is, we did settle out of court for, I mean, uh, 3.6 million. There was a, 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 a reaction down in the New Mexico. Another train caught on fire down there. Southern Pacific sold us for 4 million. And after this Roseville case was closed, they opened it up. They came up to the U.S. attorney and asked him, did we settle for the uh, nuisance fee? And he says, well, yeah, that's 100,000 and they took it. They wouldn't even go to court with us. But anyway, <clears throat> um, no deaths. I learned an awful lot about bombs. And we had the, the one other feature on this was the bombs wouldn't react that way. Mark 81 Mark bombs are 250-pound bombs, 100 pounds explosive. So we heated those things, and got them to detonate other than by a booster in the design manner. We could get the bomb in a pallet to react violently and give a detonation. But where we found out is in a pallet, the bombs are close together. So if a bomb is by itself, it doesn't set off much. If a bomb's over here, it doesn't set off too much. But if you got it in a pallet, when they go at that diagonal between the bombs, that squeezes that pressure going in. So if it's got another bomb on the other side, good chance you're going to initiate it from frag initiation. We found out another thing. The fuse wells are open. They're not packed or anything. And that fuse well will squeeze. And I want a picture I had of a detonator of a GP bomb. I found a jet oh, about that long, about that big around. I caught it on a fast film going, leaving the bomb, hitting another stack of bombs a few feet away, setting them off. 
what I would be able to do, bombs that were in, in line like that, nose to tail, nose to tail, I could get them to set off, even though the detonation died out in the diagonal and uh, horizontal and uh, vertical directions. Well, <coughs> did I have any summations here? Oh, yeah, good grief. Diesel fuel, bombs, nose tail, I got that. There was one other thing uh, was found out is when TNT melts and you, it'll rupture, it'll, you know, you get increased and it'll, it'll bust that thing open. If you have liquid TNT, hot TNT going on rusty iron that's very hot, you get almost an instant detonation on contact. So rusty iron, this is why we put liners in our bombs, because rusty iron after 20 years, and some of the people over in Iraq are finding out those old bombs from Russia can give you bad news. Um, <coughs> they can detonate because they set up a different type of chemistry, and they're a very sensitive addition compound with the TNT and the iron rust. The leaking tank was our best idea of what happened in there. That's what I came to the conclusion of. It was parked next to our car. It was on fire. It caused the, the initial explosion and follow-on explosions. I think the fact that I could pass from car to car, either for the fuel on the ground picking up, but some of the cars detonated within a few minutes. It would have been better if it had been a few seconds, but a few minutes. It would have been better if it had been a half an hour. No. Some had to get that fire through another car. A car is a damn hard thing to burn. They're heavy. They're heavy metal. And those cars were going up in detonation, 1.5, 1.6. The two was one by itself. But anyway, the idea is that these cars could have these different times, some short and some an hour long. So we had a pattern in there to understand we have a fire and stuff. So a lot of the designs we have now, we've stopped the booster shooting the jet through the fuse wells, I hope we have, and a few other things like that. Any questions? It's still not clear to me if the contention of the railroad was that that car that was behind the pusher was the source of the fire that made the bombs go, or did the fire come from somewhere else? As far as the railroad was concerned, they weren't any concern other than they didn't cause anything. They, the, it, I, I've uh, worked with the railroads on uh, five different court cases. They give you nothing to talk about or to get, arrive at. But <clears throat> um, could that have been the fire source? It was pretty far away from our ammunition cars. Yeah, it was a floor fire, and it may have went out inside the car. Smoke was seen in the yard, but we don't have enough pictures to, to in other words, this smoke like this that occurred in the yard, that muffled the whole area. I mean, if you have, I have a videos from the top, and that picture from the top, that place is just black smoke. Any whiffling smoke from a car uh, 50 yards back is not there. Also, they did <coughs> uh, start pulling cars out of there uh, when they can disconnect, so 20 further cars, they did pull them off the tracks. Now, a lot of gas, there was a lot of tank cars in there. We didn't know what they were, petroleum or they were liquid stuff. It turns out they were tomato paste, ketchup. And we had a bomb went into one of them. And the lowest ranking EOD member of the crew had to go in and sneak that damn bomb out of that. It's been sitting in there for a week. What is your conclusion about the sequence of events? Why did the bombs start going off in the first place? That was a question that they asked, asked, uh, asked us in the Benson court case. Let me see if I think of an answer. Um, <clears throat> to, get we, to get a bomb to, to go off, to explode, to deflagration, is not hard in a fire. It'll do it. But how do you get a bomb like tritonol to detonate? If I take two bombs, put them side by side, detonate one, this one, chances are, won't detonate. It's almost that, because the shock into there is going over a, a very short, very sh short piece of time, so it's just a shock initiation, not a frag. Into the 
things that we saw there. <clears throat> the first car that went up, bang, I assume had a good fuel fire, and it set cars off both directions. So where did the fuel fire come from? The under the tracks? The tracks were a, a lot of fuel. The, the train, the car that had the fuel in it, and that would be, um, let's see, is that? Here's a couple of kids running out of the yard. Uh, I'm pretty sure he t convinced her that they could go in a boxcar for the night and no one would ever find out. They made history. Anyway, back there, there's the boxcar. I think it had to be this up here, which should be, this has got the lumber pile in front of it, but there should be a tank car in the back there. It should be about where the first one went off at. I have a, I, we built a model of this, um, which, you know, I got all the things, and I go through car by car by car, action by action by action, and we had an HO model, 25 feet long, that we used in the courtroom to demonstrate where that first reaction took place. Convincing you as a technical person and convincing the federal judge this wants to get rid of the damn case is two different stories. Um, I'm talking to a lawyer that says, you know, uh, when I get a blank expression on his face, you know, he isn't going to sleep. He just doesn't get it. But, um, but the crew we had, we had some very top people that could expl explain it. Do we know the full answer to that? No. <clears throat> Best we can tell, there was an explosion in the yard, we believe, before the first, let's see if I got it. I put the model up here, there, let's see, you had a flame, and it tossed what we're going by, there was a witness up on the hill, which would be uh, right in here someplace there. And he, <coughs> when he looked at it, he could see a tank car on top of another car. And as far as we could tell, that was a, either gasoline or a, a petroleum car of some type. It wasn't pressurized gas. We knew that. And it was burning. So what was the first reaction? Now, the first reaction was not going to be really recorded on the um, seismograph because it's, it's not, that's not even noise. But what would happen would be <clears throat> is people were in the yard working. Now, as I said, people saw all different things. But before any one of these people would get into a, a, a statement or a, a deposition, they had to have their SP lawyer sitting alongside of them. And their story was very cute, very direct. And a lot of them would repeat word for word each time they said it. And they would, some of them were very nervous about what they said. Um, <clears throat> so we don't have what I would call reliable data of people observing the first fire. I don't care what color of smoke they had. Did you see smoke at 7.30? The tr train was parked at... 05. For an hour to go from a train to having a car detonate, you have one hell of a fuel storage underneath that car because I tried it with a real car, with real ammunition, with a lot of fuel under it, and you just don't bang them that quick. You have to have a massive amount of fuel. So do we know the answer to the first question? No. We have the tank car sitting up there. We have a picture of it up there. Some of the pictures I had were turned over to the other side, and they disappeared. Um, don't trust honesty in lawyers. Um, <clears throat> also, when a lawyer gets good and he looks like he's going on the case for us, we lose him. They pull lawyers as fast as they can. They say, no, you're not there. You're gone. You may get a totally different one. You don't know. But you work with them. Um, <clears throat> the tank car rupturing, burning, lining up against an ammunition car is the best we can tell right now. The pictures, the remnants of the reaction in there. 
Now, we only had a short time to go in there. They came in there within hours of the last car blowing and pu picking up the wreckage. We stopped them for a while to pick up the bombs. I watched them while they were filling craters, and I could look into the craters. There were bombs down in there, and they just pounded them right down in the ground. I went around the area, the local area where they would be. Um, I could spot where pieces of explosive TNT, because it's characteristic when it rains. And you just kind of look, and you look for a brown spot with a circle. That's your TNT spot right there. And there, it was loaded with TNT, or tritonol all through there. Tritonol is TNT with 20% aluminum. Any help? Uh, you said that the hot TNT uh, and the rust reacts. Uh, did you run the test with tritonol with pure TNT? Yes. <laughs> well, it's hard to run at the tritonol because tritonol, the aluminum doesn't melt. It just simply carries along with it. The original work was done by Robertson back in 49 of uh, liquid TNT going down and exploding on a hot metal iron. And the TNT will react with the rust? Yes. Yeah, you know, if you've got a rusty old bomb. <laughs> A lot of the chemistry we did uh, is not published, but we relied heavily on a lot of work that was done in the late 40s, early 50s on TNT. So what you said, uh, you think there are still bombs buried there? As a so legal uh, position for the government, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> is there there? Dig them up. And probably years later from now, too. Um, <clears throat> there's scary notes in there. I explained to somebody here, one of them. When th there was a lot of unexploded bombs, some of them really looked nice. You know, I could use them for destructive purposes. Well, some of the bombs were burning, and they had to get them out of there, so they stacked them up and put them on crates. They looked at it, and they thought, well, it looks like it's out. So then they would transport them from Rhodesville or Antelope Yard over to uh, Hawthorne Ammo Depot there. They being? Mark 81 bombs. So who, who are the they that was doing the transporting of these uh, bombs and when? Uh, fearless EODs. Okay. That's who would have to do it. Anyway, when we got to... Uh, the area there where the bombs were stored, I went back up to the ammunition and uh, seeing a lot of them, you know, you'd see them, they were all crusted, burned and stuff like this. And I saw this one, I looked at the back end and I said, gee, that has quite a burn. And I looked at it, I touched it, it crumbled. Before it got there, it was still burning. <laughs> Otherwise, it would never have made it over the truck. <clears throat> if the burning tank car started this whole fire, <clears throat> was that sabotage to set that one on fire? How did it start? <laughs> How about the sulfur that was burning there la the night before? Well, was that sabotage? <laughs> I can't get the records. They don't exist anymore. You the firemen exist. They showed me what, what it was. You have your opinions. Yeah. Sabotage is hard to prove because there's six ways away from doing it. Can I do it naturally? Is there enough fuel in a yard that you can strike a match and set it off? No, not quite. But if you got something with a lot of heat in it, like burning sulfur or hot sulfur, that can react with other things, you might get something going. Hot sulfur and fuel, I'm not sure. I trust the two, but uh, there's a p potential for that. Well, it's been 30 years. Every 10 years we used to meet, we haven't met this. I don't think we'll meet this time. It'd be 32 years, I guess. I don't think we met it the last 30. Anything else? I think you've given us a good example of the fog of investigation. <laughs> 
Well, if you like the real stuff, you can see it on CSI. <laughs> and I want to especially thank Jack for coming. This is a big and if anybody wants to ask him any questions afterward, feel free to stop and have some more refreshments and ask him any more questions.